I wanted to do a little bit of a forward for this video first, uh, just to address the issue that I kind of shot this video a little disjointedly. Um, quality may drop. Uh, I shot parts of this a long time ago with a different camera, and there were parts I wanted to film, like part in, during the repair, that I just neglected to. So I just wanted to do a little apology in advance if there's some quality drops and differences, and if the video feels a little disjointed. But there's a couple other videos covering this machine and subject that are really well done, so. I don't feel too bad about it. In a world of fun and fantasy and ever-changing views and computer terminology Watch this guy jogging. I.K. takes a quick look. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Cause the Commodore is keeping up with you. Well, here it is, the Commodore SX-64. This is a portable Commodore 64, or luggable, since it does require a power outlet. Uh, it doesn't have a battery in there or anything. It also went by the Commodore Executive, and it was released in 1984. wasn't horribly successful. This is probably going to be a really short video. I'm just kind of doing it because... I have it and I may as well do a video on it but there's already a lot of good information on this machine out there. Uh, Techmon, I mentioned it before, he he doesn't usually do computer stuff, usually like AV stuff, but he did a really good kind of in-depth video on the SX-64 and repairing it so I just I don't feel there's a whole lot I can add to the conversation but I was gonna make a video anyways. Maybe this is the first video you stumble across and it will lead you on to more better videos. So yeah, this one's gonna be a little bit short. And as I mentioned before, a little disjointed because um, I did repairs on this and you'll see some of that. And I, but I filmed that like a while ago with a different camera and uh, I didn't get a lot of footage for some reason. Uh, maybe I was just eager to fix it and I didn't film all the stuff I really wanted to. So. Yeah, it's, it's not that great, but yeah, we'll see. It's just going to be a short little filler video, I think. So, yeah, this is the SX-64. Now, mine has a few problems. One less problem now, though. It, originally, it wasn't usable, and you'll see that in the video. There was some a lot of graphical garbage on the screen. Uh, I fixed that. Right now, it's really just kind of cosmetic stuff. For instance, on the side here, there should be little blue caps on these they're gone. Also this handle itself doesn't work. Uh, it should be able to go into a position uh, like turn like this so you can use it as a handle and then go into this position so you can use it as a stand but uh, it will not move no matter what. It is, it's stuck. And um, I actually took this off. I took it apart and took it off and put it back on and messed with it and uh, I can't really get it to, <laughs> to move. It's, it'll either stick in a handle position or uh, this position, and I guess I'd rather it in this position for use. The other issue I've been having is this keyboard. This front plate is also the keyboard. All the keys work and register, but some of them don't register. You really have to hit the button hard. Um, that could probably be fixed if I took apart this keyboard and cleaned it out. It might be just an issue with being dirty. Uh, I just haven't really gotten around to doing that. So yeah, let's uh, take a look at the front of this real quick and then we'll take a look at the back. So this face plate comes off, you just depress these and you just pull it away and there you go. And that is the uh, SX-64 keyboard. Uh, I might accidentally refer to it as the 64SX. I, I do that a lot in my mind so I apologize if I do that, but it is the SX-64. So here is the keyboard connector that stowed away right here and uh, it goes with the keyboard hooks right here and then like that underneath here it connects now now this is kind of a proprietary thing but you can get you can make homemade versions of this cable it doesn't look as pretty as these official cables but it can be done sometimes these get lost uh, people lose them and it makes connecting the keyboard really hard and just finding these on their own can be difficult and pricey but yeah you can make homemade sort of cables for this but uh, yeah it's, it's not pretty but here's the machine here we got a little monitor this is a color monitor uh, composite monitor I believe it's five inch monitor it's actually pretty sharp it's pretty nice uh, here we have a storage bay and it actually is storage 
it says storage right here and then we have our floppy disk drive our Commodore floppy disk drive now there was supposedly a version that had two floppy disks and it was the DX64 now I don't know if it was officially released but a couple have surfaced uh, they're pretty darn rare but for just the SX64 yeah this is just a storage bay now uh, you can mod these and you can add a second disk drive here uh, it's not too complicated but there is a bit to it more than just putting in a drive and hooking it up so uh, there's guides for that check out the blog I think I have some links to pages that detail that so you can check that out if you have one of these and you're interested in adding a second disk drive and right here actually this is a little door you can open up and there's little controls in there for adjusting the monitor and adjusting your volume there is a built-in speaker so there's all your frontal controls for adjusting things like that on top here there's a cartridge port for cartridges obviously uh, stuff like this fast load cart there you go so let's take a look at the back real quick and then I'll go into some of that we'll look at some of the repair footage I'll talk about that and then I'll kind of wrap it up like I said just kind of trying to keep this one a little bit short okay so on the back here we have our two connectors for you know Commodore mice or joysticks or whatever now some of these I've noticed ha are labeled in the plastic it will say video or AV or whatever mine is smooth there's no labeling on what these connectors are so I believe the first one here is just a connector for like uh, some printers and floppy drive external floppy drives and things like that and then here is the AV port so you can't actually connect this to an external monitor you don't need to use the monitor that's built in so yeah that's handy if your monitor dies or whatever you can't output to an external monitor uh, this is the I think this is called the Commodore user port uh, I think that's for something like modems and certain printers and whatnot or connecting to actually other computers even uh, standard three-prong power fuse and this is our power switch all right, so let's talk about the initial problem I had with this. This it's very common when you get these things for them to uh, overheat. It's very compact inside, so it's it's not too uncommon to have chips over time overheat and die. Now, my originally had a problem where I powered up and the screen would be completely garbled with graphical garbage. Uh, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, that was the PLA chip. It's pretty simple and easy to replace. So. So we'll just, I'll just flip to that old footage now, and uh, we'll see this thing, what the issue was. Alright, so we're all hooked up. I don't know how well this is going to come across on the camera, but I'll show you the issue this particular machine is having. Um, so I'm going to hit the power, if I can remember where it was. Ah. Alright. And it, it takes a second to sort of warm up. There we go. And there we go. Because, well, right now it's all white, but you saw there, there's like intermittent messed up. Yeah, see? <laughs> so that's the problem. It's either a solid color or it will be garbled uh, graphics, even if you type something. Um, now, there's a lot of videos on about this. Um, it seems like the first likely suspect is the PLA chip. So that is what I'm going to try first because that's pretty much one of the easiest and um, usually that seems to be the culprit in these machines with this kind of issue. So here's the chip I opted for. Now this is not an original replacement chip. This is sort of a newer version of the PLA. Um, so supposedly this is 100% compatible. It runs a little bit better. It's more reliable. Uh, it doesn't need a heat sink. It doesn't really give off much heat. Uh, so like I said, I just went with this sort of modern uh, counterpart. So we'll take out the old one, pop this one in, and pray that it fixes the problem. Alright, so here we are inside the uh, SX, and here's the board we're going to be mostly looking at. Now there is a little connector here. Uh, yeah, I have made sure that's connected really well. So what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to uh, disconnect these, pull this board out, and the PLA chip we're replacing is 
this one right here, the second one down. So I'm gonna do that and then we'll get back to you. All right, so we have the new chip in and it's uh, connected there. Here's, here's the old one. Oh, I can't focus. Okay, yeah, there's the old one here. Um, so there is the new replacement. Now, supposedly, I think the biggest benefit of this new chip is it doesn't give off nearly as much heat, um, which is going to really be a benefit in this small, cramped uh, Commodore uh, SX64. So that, that seems to be a common reason for failure is <laughs> chips overheating. All right. So we've replaced the chip. Um, I have turned it on and the screen has looked pretty good. So let's let's turn it on here. If I can why do I have so much trouble finding the power switch? Alright, so let's let's test it out here with the uh, replaced PLA chip. And it takes a second. It takes a second and uh there we go and it looks good so I don't know if... so there we go so we're looking good there um, we're not out of the woods yet uh, I don't have a Commodore 64 cartridge game around to test but I did have the fast load cart and uh, that did seem to work and unfortunately I, I do have a lot of Commodore 64 games they are all uh, buried right now in the closet. Uh, so I went, and because I'm so lazy, I do not want to dig through the closet for Commodore games. Uh, I went to a nearby local game shop, uh, Fallout Games, and they had this nice sealed Commodore 64 game for a cool uh, $2. Uh, it's like a gambling game, not not the most thrilling thing, but for, for $2 sealed, uh, I can't really complain. Um, I guess I would have rather paid a dollar fifty cents, but I just need something to test out here. And I'm le if you could see my closet with full of games, you would understand why I wouldn't don't feel like sifting through all those. All right, so yeah, some of these commands, uh, like some of the letters, like work just fine, um, like L and O, but A P you really have to press hard, and some of them it really takes a couple presses. Uh, before it registers, so I tried cleaning the contacts on both ends uh, for the keyboard connector. It seemed to help a little bit, but yeah, there's definitely some issues with the keyboards. All right, so there's a better view of the monitor here. Sorry about that if you really couldn't see it before. I turned out the lights and zoomed in on it, so it looks pretty good. Um, the disk drive seems to be working all right. Um, you will start with 50. This is just a, like I said, this is just a gambling game. I hope there's some sound though, because I, I do want to test that SID chip. So, of uh, this whole thing of Commodore discs I have so far, um, the only thing that's worked is this stupid gambling thing, and it doesn't have much sound effects, but um, I, I turned up the volume, and the sound is kind of working, although it sounds like weird. Um, here, it's a little garbled. That's pretty much all the sound you get with this game. I wish I had a game working where like, you know, there's a little bit more like music or something so I could tell how well the audio is doing and if the SID chip is okay, but this game it's just so I guess I'll keep searching for a game that works. Uh I guess the sounds working okay. I got hundred thousand dollar pyramid here working but that sound is I don't know if it's supposed to sound like that or not I mean the the CRT is real nice I mean that's real it's real sharp um, the screen looks really good but the sound I don't really know if, if that's how it's supposed to sound <laughs> it sounded really weird I got Bubble Ghost working, and it, it sounds, I've never played the game before, but 
It sounds okay, so I guess the sound is working, so that is definitely a plus. So what are my thoughts on the Commodore SX-64, the portable Commodore 64? Uh, well, I'm going to answer that in two parts. I'm going to answer it maybe from the perspective of the early 80s, and then I'll answer it from the perspective of a retro computer collector or gamer now. So first off, I would like to point out that I don't think these are particularly rare. Uh, I have come across several of them in the wild in my lifetime. Now, there weren't tons and tons of these made like the normal Commodore 64, but I, I don't know. I, maybe I've just been really lucky, but I hesitate to call these rare. Uh, I see them time to time on like Craigslist still, and I've found a few it just like, not necessarily like yard sales, but electronic swap meets. That's actually where I picked this one up. So, uh, yeah, I, I've never paid more than $50 for one of these things. I have two of them, actually. Uh, one I got for free maybe 10 years ago. It doesn't work at all. Uh, it's on the other side of the country in my storage unit. Um, this one I think I paid not too much for. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't call them, like, super rare or anything. Uh, the DX version, though, is super rare. So if you do come across one of those, uh, scoop it up unless it's an insane price. And from what I've heard, they go can go, if they do show up on eBay, they usually can go for over $1,000. So, yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, what do I think of this thing maybe from the perspective of the 80s? Now, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, it actually didn't sell all that well. They only sold it for a few years, and it wasn't really considered a big success. Um, I just... I, I don't know. I, I mean, the whole thing of it is, is a portable Commodore 64. Like, do you need a portable Commodore 64, though? It, it wasn't really known as a business machine, so, you know, businessmen that were doing a lot of traveling and moving around, it, they probably would have been using a Commodore 64 for their business paperwork and stuff. So that market, even though I'm sure it kind of existed, it probably wouldn't have been as big as like, you know, like Osborne's or stuff like that where we're really business focused, luggable. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it would have been too successful on the business front. Now, as like a, a family computer or a kid's computer in the mid 80s, or early 80s, even late 80s, um, what really is there much benefit to this portability and having that monitor. I, I just, I don't think it would have been that much of an inconvenience. Now, the Commodore 64, the bread box, and the Commodore 64C is pretty small and light. Now, just getting a little cardboard box, putting the Commodore 64 in it, putting an external disk drive in it, some cables, um, I don't think that would have been too much of a hassle. It might even have been lighter than this. Uh, since this has some metal in it, and you got that CRT display there, it might actually have been lighter to put an actual Commodore 64 and an external floppy drive and the cables into a little box and taking it with you wherever you went. Plus, you would have just hooked it up to a bigger monitor. That, that's a pretty small monitor. So if you're, you're going on vacation, you want to take your Commodore 64, or you're going to Grandma's or something, um, they probably would have had a television, possibly with a composite output uh, or an input that you could have used. Um, that would have been the only thing. In the early 80s, not every TV had a composite input, so that might have been an issue, but portability, I just don't see, I don't feel like this would have been a ton of advantage. I mean, it would have been a little convenient being one package, you just grab it the handle and take it, but I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how well that <laughs> angle works um, for that. Although I guess you could have just took the Commodore 64 or Commodore SX64 and then used the external uh, AV and then hooked it up to a bigger TV. So I guess in that sense it would have been pretty portable and useful. But eh, I don't I don't know. Uh, it, it would have been cool to have still, but I I don't know how much better it is over a regular Commodore 64. Plus um, I neglected to mention I need to mention there are some compatibility issues. Uh, I haven't run into any, and I don't think they're massive, but there are some compatibility issues, and even with some games. Uh, the default screen, it's white, uh, I believe it's blue text on white, whereas, you know, your regular Commodore 64, it's white text on a blue background. I um, hope I didn't get those mixed up. Uh, but, yeah, that's, th so, and some games actually expect the default screen, so 
there's some compatibility issues with this. So I don't think they're big, but they do exist. So, all right. So the perspective of a retro computer enthusiast or gamer these days. Uh, I would just recommend getting a regular Commodore 64. You, they're probably cheaper, uh, although prices on all this stuff's been shooting up lately. But deals still can be had if you're lucky, um, and I still think they're more common than this guy. And they just not. You don't have to deal with compatibility issues. You can you know hook them up to whatever. It's just it just seems like a better uh, deal. Now, if you're just a collector and you like cool old hardware, Commodore stuff, especially if you're a Commodore collector, yeah, these are pretty cool to have in a collection. Um, you know, sometimes they get looks. Uh, you know, if you have someone over looking at your like, oh, here's my Commodore 64 portable. It's like, huh? Um, but yeah, I mean, I personally, I wouldn't go out of my way for one of these things, and I wouldn't spend, you know, hundreds of dollars on one for sure. Uh, but yeah, if you're just a gamer and you like gaming on like original hardware, I would really strongly suggest just getting a standard Commodore 64. Uh, but if you're like a collector and you collect different hardware pieces, then this will probably be worth getting, especially if you're really into Commodore stuff, because it is cool. There is a cool factor to it, but, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that's this has been my quick video on the Commodore SX64. Almost did it there. Uh, so if you have any comments, uh, you know, if you have a different view on how useful this thing, or if you would actually prefer one of these over a, uh, just a Commodore 64, the, not the luggable, let me know in the comments. And uh, I'll see you in the next video, and I uh, hope you guys have a good one. before companies cared about diversity in their marketing. It's like, Commodore's like, we're marketing to 40 plus year old white men and that is it.